Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super excited to be talking about radical social entrepreneurs. We have Michael Strong joining us on the show, hello. Thank you, Alan, great to be here. Very blessed to have you. I love your mind, your mental lattice on the world. This is gonna be a lot of fun. I'm excited to be here. Sweet, so let's give a background to Michael Strong. For those that don't know, he has 28 years of experience building out radically innovative programs in schools, K through 12, based on Montessori principles, Socratic principles. Very excited to be talking about that. He's also the founder of Academy of Thought and Industry. He's also co-founder of Conscious Capitalism, and he's a two-time author and so much more. Very excited to unpack this. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the big history perspective on civilization. We find ourselves as stewards of Earth. Mm -hmm. What is your current take on the synthesis of human experiments? So one of the things I'm deeply fascinated about is the concept of evolutionary mismatch. We all know that we were not designed to have access to much, as much fat and sugar as we all have and as little physical activity. What we don't know, or I don't think people are as broadly aware of, is the evolutionary mismatch between our kind of mind and social relationships. Yes. So, you know, I work with teens. I see the, there's an epidemic of adolescent dysfunction. I think the epidemic of adolescent dysfunction, including you know, mental illness, eating disorders, self-harm, suicide, is all a symptom of a different kind of evolutionary mismatch. We evolved to be in tribes where at the age of 12, 13, we'd be part of the adult community, you know, hunting our first deer or taking on adult female responsibilities. And we were in a culture that had a sense of virtue and honor and dignity and one wanted to be, you know, do the right thing in this culture. Yeah. Now we're scattered and our, our, everything is a mess. So my deep interest is the creation of healthy communities. Sometimes I talk about what I do as paleo education by analogy. <laughs> yeah, with paleo, with paleo food. And it's funny, I do know people who are into, you know, I know John Durant, author of the Paleo Manifesto, who actually went out and, you know, did one of those endurance hunting where after three days they got a antelope, but they were yeah. too tired to actually kill it. So they exhausted the antelope, they collapsed. So, I'm not paleo in that sense exactly, though I respect it, but yeah, I think that young people need a community, the kind of tight-knit community that was necessary, that we evolved in for millions of years. So super interested in you know, how in various ways that have not yet been recognized, uh, evolutionary mismatch is responsible for the leading public health crises of our time. Um, right now, behavioral disorders including substance abuse and mental illness, uh, functional mental illness, are the largest causes of disability in the U.S. and rapidly spreading around the world. So we got a lot to fix. What an interesting term, evolutionary mismatch, because we have such an abundance and ubiquity in food now mm -hmm. where it's just on every single corner so often, so many meals, so much obesity now, mm -hmm. more obese people than starving people on yeah. the planet. What? Yeah. And then another interesting, the, the paleo education. Right. That was the first time I heard that too. The, your nomenclature is so cool. I love your words that you use. These neologisms are so important for mm -hmm. creating new ways of perception. Big time. Yes. So, okay, so paleo education is cool because you take these first principles ways of thinking about how to water a seed, a mind right. into the world, and you help the, the child fully realize big history, fully realize critical thinking, fully mm -hmm. realize how these technological devices hitting them up 150 times a day mm -hmm. can actually be more cancerous to their creative endeavoring. So I'm gonna, it's tricky because um, there's one kind of way of looking at the world, actually I'm really fascinated with this, that uh, one reading, do you know who Julian Jaynes is? The, uh, the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Okay, oh, okay. So you've got yeah, to read yeah. Julian Jaynes. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big Julian Jaynes fan. Yeah. In some ways, he interprets um, getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden as this transition from kind of the, the, consci the holistic consciousness that we had prior to you know, the split mind. But yeah. then, uh, so I'm a big fan of Greek rationality, and this is where it gets tricky because I do think that we had a social emotional wholeness prior to rational thought and uh, to a great extent, the kind of rational thought that really was coming out of the Socratic interactions of ancient Athens have ultimately led to the prosperity we have today, but at a tremendous cost. Yeah. And so my goal is how do we, and this goes back to big history, so the how do we- social emotional wholeness, that's where Big it time, comes. big yeah. time. So how do we enjoy all the goodies of science and technology <laughs> and you know, hey, I want a warm shower in the morning. Yeah. I like hot showers, yes, you know? Yes. 
and at the same time, um, there's an epidemic of misery. So how do we create Access subcultures? To the world's knowledge, yeah. All <laughs> well, and, and, and a, a subculture. So I'm about healthy subcultures. You know, last time we went, we talked about you know circling and mindfulness and vipassana and yes, yes. also just healthy, good relationships. So I think we evolved to be in purpose-driven cultures, and you know. Indigenous cultures were purposeful in the sense of survival, <laughs> you know, but that gave you a lot of purpose. You know, my wife's from Senegal, Magat Wade, she yeah. was on your show. Yeah. And in Senegal, it's not, you know, fully indigenous anymore, but the adolescence, there's not the epidemic of adolescent dysfunction there. And I, I see tragic numbers of kids, you know, just self-harm cutting yeah. in, a, in a poor culture. They're not out cutting themselves. You know, they're out working hard. They're part of their communities. They respect their elders. So there's a really complicated transition going from the kind of social, emotional, and wellness then, but abject poverty and half yeah, or more yeah. of the babies died and <laughs> no warm showers. Yeah. Now we've got all the goodies, but we're miserable. Not all of us. I'm, I'm happy. I, I think you're happy. Yeah, yeah. You know, but we've found purpose and community. So how can we, the next new technology, I love my iPhone, but the next new technology are subcultures of happiness and well-being. Sometimes I describe myself as an entrepreneur of happiness and well-being. You know, yeah. we've got enough stuff. Most people in the developed world have more than enough stuff. So even, even materialism, I, my perception yeah. is that, you know, there are the, you know, environmentalists who want to kind of preach in a sort of puritanical way about don't be so materialistic. I'm like, no. Instead, let's satisfy our social emotional needs and our purpose needs in warm, rich communities of purpose. and. I don't need stuff, you know, warm shower, but other, you know, I, I think it's all sort of embarrassing. People that need big cars and stuff, like, I'm sorry, sorry, dude, that you have those, you know, there are always jokes about the little penises, whatever. Yeah. You know, <laughs> if you have, if you're Obama socially. Obama just said that, why do you need eight women twerking around you to feel like you're yeah, if happy? Yeah, you're, if you're purpose driven and socially, emotionally well, you don't need a lot of stuff. Maslow's hierarchy, got it? Let's self actualize and do good in the world and have fun. So ultimately, you know, I'm, in that sense, I want everybody to have a blast spending all day, every day, doing good and enjoying it and feeling like there's nothing more delightful in helping other human beings by yes. means of our projects. Yes, yes. Okay, holy cow. All right, so there's, there's two things just quick to touch on yeah. there. First, your fascination with communities. I just love how much you care about that. And yes, as we talked about these, these little subculture pockets like Vipassanas yeah. and yeah. circlings. Um, and also, like you said, we have so much stuff now. We've, in these, on your big history perspective of, of, of society, you say that this social emotional wholeness that mm -hmm. we had took a took a back seat to the technological scientific ex explosion, yeah. which now there's so much stuff, there's so much ubiquity, there's so much excess information, mm -hmm. but we're not structuring that data, structuring that knowledge, mm -hmm. making our communities and our social emotional well-being also a priority at the same time. So that's kind of the next essence, the next generational way of thinking is needing to include those two halves together. Big time, and you know, I hesitate to call it information because, and again, I focused on adolescence. I think when I look at the dysfunction Function of adult society. I spend a lot of time with middle schoolers, and I love middle schoolers, and they're challenging. I look at um, our adult society as middle schoolers all over the place. You know, Donald Trump is a mean seventh grader. <laughs> you know, so if we can help people transition out of the Lord of the Flies stage, you know, the William Golding, author of Lord of the Flies, was a middle school teacher. He knows what you know kids are like without the right healthy virtue community. So I want to create healthy virtue communities where these young people have incredible energy and plasticity. Yeah. And right now, all that energy and plasticity is being consumed by digital media, gaming, porn, yeah. um, social media, bullying, teens saying shit about each other online, yeah. and um, consumerism and materialism. What, what sneakers am I wearing? wearing? And what, you know, all of that stuff. But instead, if we give them a sense of, I want to be excellent in this culture, in this way, yeah. because you know, I want to seek the truth, or I want to seek the good, or yes, whatever. Yes. And so to that extent, I'm also extremely culturally you know, diverse in the sense that, although I'm very much an intellectual, I respect military schools, or Catholic yes, schools, or yes, Jewish schools, yes. or whatever, where they're you know, creating a healthy subculture where kids' needs are being met. I don't care what the subculture is, as long as they're not harming other people. Correct. Yes, and yes. as long as we're you know, helping young people develop in a healthy way. And as long as civilization is going towards that harmonious truth with, with each other and with nature um, and aligning really well to that prosperity, to that pinnacle point that we can, we can actually be, which um, I, I really also, yeah. I, I'm just such, I'm, I'm so 
I adore the way that you talk about n giving the seeds of children nutrients mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. seeing what can happen when they pursue truth at the greatest excellence or pursue mm -hmm. good at the greatest excellence. Yep. Um, and so much of, of the mind, the neural real estate, the mm -hmm. limited biological infrastructure we have here is consumed on the materialism and consumed on the digital media side of things. So your focus in the last 28 years hustling on this is fascinating to me and we we're already obviously seeing that come come through you right mm -hmm. now and it's so cool so i don't think enough people get montessori get socratic understandings of what that means for mm -hmm. k through 12 education mm -hmm. teach us about how you've applying those principles into school. A absolutely yes. i'll start with the socratic piece because that's where i started so you know right now you and i are talking about ideas so socratic fancy word but um, we're talking about ideas, we're having fun talking about ideas. You have fun doing this, that's the whole inspiration for your channel. I have fun doing this, I selfishly create schools because it's fun, <laughs> you know. And I think once people get into the world of talking about ideas, it's a blast, you know. Sometimes I've had teachers ask, is this appropriate for all learning styles? And I point to the lunchroom and kids are blah, 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 blah. Human beings are made to talk. You know, that's, and talk about, you know, evolutionary. We evolved to talk. And yeah. there's, a lot, there's a lot going on there. So then the question is, how do we make talk you know, relevant and important? I'm very fascinated with Jewish culture. Jewish culture, for 2,500 years, they've been arguing about ideas. I mean, basically, I once had a rabbi come into one of my Socratic classrooms, and he said, that's just what we did in Talmudic school. This is a great new image of school. I want to break everybody's notion of what a school is. I actually have an essay called 10 School Designs, which is way out there. But that, this Talmudic school, he said that the students would argue all day in isolation, all week, and then on Fridays, they'd take apart the red velvet curtain and then get asked the rabbi one question. <laughs> so in terms of you know, teacher-student ratio, you know, the rabbi is alone and the kids are, you know, the, the young adults are arguing all the time and then they ask rabbi one question. So that's <laughs> my ideal. Friday. Exactly. That's my ideal is, okay, you guys go do it and then, you know, I'll let you ask one. But arguing, thinking about ideas. I'm a Platonist. You know, the truth of good and the beautiful. How do we pursue the truth of good and the beautiful in our conversation? So when I was in high school, I had a teacher and that's all we did. Instead of regular school, you know, we talked about ideas. We read Buber and Nietzsche and Plato and so forth. And for me, it was like, you know, those films where it goes from black and white to color. All of a sudden, life was in color. And for me, the rest of school was yeah. incredibly dull. Um, so, uh, you know, at this point, I describe conventional secondary school as seven years of boredom and cruelty. As an adult, I'm never as bored as I was in school. And if people are jerks, I don't hang out with them. And so why? All is torture when there's this fun thing you can do. So then I uh, was, I discovered St. John's College, Great Books College, Santa Fe, New Mexico. For four years, all you do is read and think and talk about books. All you do. So there are no lecture classes. I was talked into going to Harvard because look, you can study Greek and Plato and so forth. But famous people talking at me, boring. So I went to St. John's, four years talking about ideas. And then I wanted to share this with kids. So Mortimer Adler, he wrote How to Read a Book. Um, I was under his program in Chicago and I was training teachers and students. I'd never had a background, no, not one class in education, but I experienced doing the Socratic thing. So I went into classrooms and would train teachers how to lead Socratic conversations with kids. Yeah. Um, it was like lighting a fire in a gas tank. The kids were <laughs> um, Eventually, when I read, wrote my book, The Habit of Thought, it was because that was the first time a group of students came to me and they said, this is the first time an adult has ever listened to me. They said, our parents don't listen to us, our bosses don't listen to us, our teachers don't listen to us, our ministers don't listen to us. But basically, the very simplest version of Socratic is, I say something, you think about it, listen, and respond. And a lot of what I train students to do is, um, one person s says something about, we read a text together, we talk about it. Um, I ask questions. My whole role as a leader is to ask questions, just like you're asking yeah. questions. Yeah. And it sounds simple, but students rarely have the experience of just engaging in intellectual dialogue. Yes. And once they get it, it can be hard to transition. I've been in classrooms where it's really hard to get there. And part of the artistry yeah. of doing this is dealing with a huge range of students. Yes. But once they get there, they have fun. The school in Austin I created, the students would have Socratics after school for fun. They had online class Socratic dialogues over the summer for fun. Once you get the bug of talking about ideas, it's a way of life. You know, with Magat on our first date, um, I was asking her questions all the time and she said, oh, this is annoying, shut up. Uh, 
this is not going so well. <laughs> but um, eventually she loved it. Now she and I talk about ideas all, <laughs> all the time. time. Yeah, yeah. You know, again, once you get hooked, so that for me the Socratic piece is let's create an intellectually rich culture. And so my whole thing is creating a subculture. Everybody else is like, oh, school is curriculum and pedagogy and assessment. Yeah, all of that stuff exists. But for me, the essence is what is the culture? For me, the school is only successful when the kids are starting to talk about ideas outside of class, when it's real for them, when it matters to them. And then at that point, then you've got an intellectual subculture. They read, they write, they think, and yeah. learning happens. Um, conversely, I mean, to go back to the Montessori piece, yeah. so Maria Montessori, 100 years ago, um, first Italian doctor in Italy, first female Italian doctor in Italy, and she was sent to work with you know, kids with issues. And she developed this method where it's based on student autonomy. So if you go to a, and every, every person should go see a Montessori preschool, you see these little four-year-olds walking around the room, you know, pur purposively doing their work. They uh, look like they're complete adults, and it's cool to see these tiny little kids. Maria Montessori said the greatest sign of success of a teacher is when the students are, act are acting just the same when you're not there. So any class, I would say any class where the teacher needs to be there for the kids to be learning is not yet a successful class. Yeah. I'd say that's 99.9% .9 of schools, schools. In, in America. So Montessori has huge oh. emphasis on autonomy and <clears throat> accountability, mm -hmm. and we carry those principles into the secondary level. Maria Montessori did not create a secondary model. One essay about farm school, which is great. But uh, in addition to the Socratic piece, where we create rich intellectual culture, we support radical student autonomy with respect to cool projects. I want students to do real world projects. We had a kid in Austin who um, book was a band concert promoter, so he was booking bands, booking venues, selling tickets, um, made about 6,000 bucks in 10th grade. By the time he graduated from high school, he had a three-day music festival, Austin Terror Fest, which he co-founded. He had booked 200 bands by the time he's a high school senior. You know, so if you can cool. do stuff like that, yeah, let's just go do it. And again, going back to the traditional society, um, creating Austin Terror Fest may not look very paleo, but taking on adult-level responsibility, yeah. doing real-world things that are meaningful, and not just, you know, high school assignment. You know, if, if it's just an exercise for the teacher, it's not happening. It has to be meaningful in their social and cultural system and with respect to their long-term goals. And so, you know, that's kind of autonomy and accountability is Montessori, the deep intellectual culture is the Socratic, and then ultimately purpose-driven and warm, supportive community. So we create this little paleo subculture mm -hmm. adapted for 21st century, you know, creative entrepreneurial, you know, beings, and kids do what they do because they love it. I, you know, you do what you love because you love what you do. I do what I love. I love what I do. Why can't we develop subcultures where yes. teens love what they do and do what they love? Yes. yes. To, to think that there are so many nutrients that are being helped with the seeds that are growing that are the nutrient densities or uh, arrays of nutrients are lacking to those seeds because like you said, how mm -hmm. can you have an actual classroom where the teacher needs to be present, mm -hmm. instructing all the time, the Socratic method of, of them mm -hmm. having discourse. These, these two words, nuance and equanimity, I right. think are so important in the Socratic yep. dialogue, this method, because one needs to have the multivariate perspective. There's mm -hmm. so many variables happening that we're talking about, so it's not binary, mm -hmm. and also the equanimity that I'm, even though your opinion is going to differ from mine, mm -hmm. that I'm going to stay calm and still engage and be pleasant and all that kind of stuff. So those two things with Socratic and then with Montessori, that the, they're going to be accountable to want to... Mm -hmm to want to learn you're there the it's funny monday through friday that I, i'm imagining just coming in um mm -hmm. with a bunch of other people your age mm -hmm. and having discourse about critical thinking like how to govern mars mm -hmm. right so something like right. that what protocols right. do you take from earth's civilization yep. and what do you bring to mars's civilization mm -hmm. right and they have to bop, 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 yep. monday through friday they yep. from like whatever time they arrive to whatever time they leave mm -hmm. and then they come up you know they're designing their own ideas and projects yep stuff and you peel back the curtain on Friday and you get to right, ask one right. question. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think one of the things is all of this sounds nice and it is really hard to get going. Once you get it going then it runs automatically. But this is why I'm interested in culture. Yeah. Because um, again in Jewish culture you, you don't need to talk kids into talking about ideas. They've been hearing, you know, and not all, these are generalizations, but they've been hearing, I come from a working class, um, you know, Protestant family. 
it was considered rude to you know, ask questions of your elders. When I came back from St. John's uh, to talk to my grandfather over the Christmas holidays my first year, I was asking him questions like this. I wanted to have fun with him. And he was like, why are you harassing me? Again, in many cultures, it's considered radically inappropriate to engage in this behavior. And so I'm extremely interested in this for social mobility. Because I think there's some subcultures where it's normal to be intellectual and other subcultures, and I'm not blaming those. Um, every culture adapted to its particular circumstances, and that's fine. But uh, we need to kind of crank it up if those kids want to have a great life. So this whole thing, I'm very deliberately culture creating when I go into a new environment with kids and things like uh, equanimity. How do we disagree so we don't get pissed off at each other? And sometimes some regular teachers look at the, this and sounds great, but you know, there are sometimes emotional explosions, and one of the reasons we use a text is to make it more distant. I often, with a new group, might have, say, a mathematics text, because if I started on a political subject, you know, fights right away. And so there are different ways yeah. in which you know, we very carefully cultivate the kind of interaction that you, know, you and I, you know, we're already immersed in the water, we don't even know we're swimming in the water, yeah. but most people are not yet there and especially many kids from households where it's not yeah, the norm, yeah, yeah. we have to bring them in very carefully. Okay, <clears throat> this is kind of, this is our mm -hmm. perfect kind of segue into, yeah. into what you're doing because yeah. um, Academy of Thought and Industry, you, the way that you're proposing um, this transition is very fascinating to me because like you said, there's different socioeconomic statuses, there's different parental involvements in the right. engaging of their children's full creative potential. Yep. So there's these different variables that need to be balanced if you drop a political subject right away yep. into a really disruptive classroom, it'll be really tough to make this happen mm -hmm. if you somehow slowly ease them into it with a mm -hmm. non-political subject. So yeah, so teach us about this process of kind of like easing the, 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 the kids. And you have two schools right now, right. Austin and San Francisco, yep. and those are roaring and you're going to have New York and St. Louis by August yep. of 2019, which is very exciting. So yep. it's, this is, yeah, teach us about this. Yeah, so um, first, I, I, there are various things that I pr think prevent parents from being comfortable doing this, and I, I want to democratize this, so I do a weekly um, YouTube call with a uh, six-year-old. I've been working with her since she's four, so I can kind of model this, because uh, once you know how to do it, it's easy. The trick is getting there. So, for instance, one of the things, one of the way I always approach it is, I want to know what you think, and mm -hmm. not just you. I want to know Alana's the yeah. six-year-old. I want to know what Alana thinks. So, in a recent call, I was asking her about, she was in a shoe store, you know, her dad just gets the iPhone and we start talking. And uh, you know, I know she knows, say, what 20 minus 15 is. And so I th was asking her about, you know, when you buy something and you pay money, you know, how do, do they give you change? How do you know when to give you change? I don't think she had ever thought about this. Again, cool. she's six. But I want to know how does, I was not didactically trying to teach her anything. I was not manipulating her into Correct. any kind of an answer. I want to know what's inside her brain. I want to know her reality. I want to see the world through the eyes of the six-year-old. And because she trusts that I'm not there to be didactic or manipulative, that I honestly care, you know, I see her and I want to understand her mind. And with all my students, I want to say, how do you see the world? And then I ask them questions and so they get to explain it. If they think that I'm going to be didactic or manipulative, and this is a problem with ed conventional education, in a regular classroom, the teacher has a destination. And so, oh, Alan, I think that's a nice thought you had about to killing a mockingbird, but it's really about this. Or, you know, their questions are always manipulative. And I'm not saying that every teacher is, but the standard format of a standard class is we are teaching a lesson, and by the end of the lesson, you need to know this. I'm not, I've radically rejected that. I'm not saying you need to know yeah, anything. Yeah. You know, we might be reading something together, but how do you make sense of this paragraph? How do you, you know, what, what counts as justice? How do you know it's just? How do, I had a, a girl in a class recently who's a big advocate of political violence. That's interesting. How do you know when it's appropriate to be violent politically and when not? You know, and I think, you know, she's an anarchist and she thought, oh, the teacher's going to be freaked out because I'm advocating violence. No, let, you know, tell me about it. Let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I want to learn about it. Behind the and eyes. other students then, oh my gosh, but then they, they want to know too. Okay, well, in some, you know, if, if there is slavery, do the slaves have a right to be violent to the masters? You know, at, at what point, you know, it does it become genocide? There are all sorts of interesting things. You know, at first she was advocating for the Nazis, then she realized, well, I don't want to advocate for the Nazis. You know, these kids have to think through these things. So I see it as, let's find a way where we don't get pissed off at each other to try to understand each other's ideas. 
Now again, when I say, I say X, use, listen, and reply thoughtfully, that implies that when I say, um, you know, maybe we should you know, engage in political violence, hmm, that's interesting, why and when and where and how, without kind of freaking out. Um, you know, oh, you believe that an unborn child, uh, you know, should be aborted, and I think that's a human life that should not, hmm, that's interesting. You know, I'm kind of exaggerating, hmm, cause just because in an adult life, people are, you know, in some ways ready to kill each other of these issues, but if we wanna have a civilized conversation, we need to be able to think through these things um, before we get to a destructive point. Um, David Bohm, who's a famous 20th century theor theoretical physicist, has a wonderful book on dialogue where he calls this, at a public scale, sociotherapy. So just like individual psychotherapy might be necessary to kind of figure out who we are and wh wh what's going on, sociotherapy is we have such different worldviews. How can we talk in a civilized way to kind of work through them? You know, that, that's how, how that, I love how you go into behind the eyes of the young person mm -hmm. and again you're not aiming to m manipulate, you're aiming mm -hmm. to understand. You're mm -hmm. not saying that this is one right answer, you're saying that how can you understand their worldview mm -hmm. and ask an interesting question that gets them to expand their awareness of the understanding of reality that they're in. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I pulled up the, you know, the thoughtandindustry.com site here mm -hmm. and What's cool is that, you know, you're getting, you have your high school for teens who want to excel on their own terms. That this is a, this sentence here mm -hmm. is about you creatively flourishing. This is not you fitting into a high school box. Right. That we know mm -hmm. that this is exactly what is right. Yeah. There are certain aspects though that I wanted to kind of like ask you about in the sense of like, you know, you want a seed. Mm -hmm that is being molded into the world to right. understand the big history perspective on mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. You want them to realize that 100 billion humans built the civilization before us. Mm -hmm. And for them to really get that, to get that gratitude that we all evolved here on just this rock. How do you ask the right questions? To, or, so there are some things in this box that we can say of like knowledge that are important so, so it's like on your own terms, but you have to know the big history that's thing. That's a right? really interesting tension. Okay. So first of all, um, by nature, it sounds like as if you are in that sense more didactic than I am. Okay. Alan has a digit you have to know this. Big history, so, it's so important to know. <laughs> there yeah. we go. So part of this is, uh, you know, because you know, I'm operating in this US culture, one of the most common destinations for students obviously is college. And in order to prepare students for college and to do well at college, um, you know, for instance, it's useful to know uh, world history and it's useful to know biology and so forth. And so the, instead of me saying, this is what you should know, um, you know, I explain to them as a coach. So my whole orientation is more coaching them. And uh, it is useful to be an educated adult. If somebody for some reason really does not want to, that's a different conversation. I'll give you an example in a minute. But, um, you know, for most students who are going to college, uh, things like biology, including deep evolutionary biology, and world history, including going from evolutionary biology to what's usually called you know, ancient history. So big history fits in quite nicely with anybody who's college bound, and it makes it more interesting and relevant. And so rather than, you need to know big history, like, look, if you want to be an educated person, you really need to know, yeah. you know biology and history. This is a cool way to think about it. And yeah, I, yeah. I'm personally fascinated by you know, evolutionary biology, evolutionary mismatch, evolutionary psychology. I think it's just a cool way to understand the world. So the other thing is I can be, um, in addition to the utilitarian, this is what's useful for college, there's also the as a witness, as it were. That is, these things fascinate me personally. Separately from that, going back to students who may not want the whole standard high school curriculum, um, I've had, I get a lot of creatives who maybe want to be yeah. filmmakers, yeah, designers, yeah. that kind of thing. And what's more common, um, you know, I haven't had a real fight over, say, history so much. Over time, that becomes relevant. A lot of them don't want to do a lot of math. Yeah, and yeah. Picasso could barely do arithmetic. He turned out okay. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I, for instance, had a um, design student who, won, who was going to Parsons School of Design who didn't want to take Algebra II. And his parents were okay with that. I was okay with that. No problem. You don't need yeah. algebra too. So I would say we're willing to kind of craft things more yes. on an individual basis. That's interesting. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, 
I'm, that said, ultimately, I don't demand that every student you know, has to have X. I'm very pragmatic of, you know, I'll say something like, if you don't know, you know, you'll come across as an idiot, you know. You know, I, I'm not saying you need to know this, but people do. They evaluate you on how you dress, on, you know, how you speak the English language, how you write, and if you come across as ignorant, it'll show. Um, you know, if that's what yeah. you want, you know, be well. Yeah. It, okay, so tackling this tension seems to be probably the hardest mm -hmm. thing that's, that's going on with um, Academy of Thought and Industry because you want to do your best to have them be on their terms. Right. Learning is on your terms. Right. You want to be excellent yep. in your own terms. Yep. Uh, at the same time, mm -hmm. you want to, to, to know like how to, because you can't actually talk right. without knowing language and without knowing how Big to be time. calm and without. So things yeah. like, you know, reading, writing, speaking skills are incredibly important. So part of this is, you know, you were in sales, I'm a salesman for these things that I believe are important and an yeah. unapologetic salesman. So just to be articulate, um, I explained to them that if you are really articulate, you will have so many benefits in life. And actually, yeah. much more important than doing well on a history or bio test is to be articulate. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can write well, uh, this is from my personal life, very often in meetings, I'll offer to write up the notes yeah. of the meeting because it's strategic. He who writes up what happened to that meeting just controlled that meeting. <laughs> you know, different case, um, I've done very well with cold called emails. So, you know, I worked with John Mackey, CEO of Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. Originally, that's through a cold call email uh, to Gary Hoover, his fellow entrepreneur. So one of the things I talk to students about is how to write emails uh, to somebody you don't know. Yes, and totally. it's not just about grammar and punctuation. Again, sales. How do you get inside somebody else's head so you can be persuasive? Totally. Um, Zach Slayback is kind of a brilliant writer on this. Mm -hmm. But those sorts of things, they get that. So I'm not telling them you need to know the date of the American Revolution. Anyway, if you don't, you will come across as an idiot. But more broadly, you know, if you want to be effective at a certain level, you need these skills. And you know, they, they certainly respect my, and I give them a lot of real world stories. One of the things I ask is that our teachers have some real world experience because it turns out that the quadratic you know, um, equation might not be useful in most real world situations, but reading and writing effectively and being broadly informed about the world, pretty important in a lot of situations. This tension is so hard for me to wrap myself around because I'm all about like the right nutrients for the seeds, right? And you're and you're also a, about that while simultaneously being about letting the seeds go. And I'm also right. about that, letting them explore on their terms. So this is just such an interesting point about. I'm glad we got here. So let me give you yeah. another piece, and this is a big difference between me and you know many educators. So one of the biggest fears about say school choice is that um, some schools won't teach I evolution. And evolution is a really big part of my worldview. That said, I think the, the health and well-being of teens is much more important than evolution. So I'm perfectly happy to allow for, you know, say religious schools that don't teach about evolution. And thus, from your and my perspective, um, they might be wacko from a scientific perspective. But if teens are not killing themselves or cutting, yeah, yeah, that's okay yeah. with me. And I, I, part of this too is I have faith that over time, you know, the truth will end out and the education will end out. And at this point with the internet, um, you know, you can't keep somebody in a box. They'll find out about everything. So I think those sort of old style fears are gradually going and the health and well-being being signed becomes more important. And the, the fact is too, because you teach something in school doesn't mean that anybody learned it. That's one of the biggest delusions, delusions of our time. We need to teach the kids X. Give you an example um, about but language is yes to that. Yeah, but kind of going to concrete knowledge curve. Um, the fewer than one, about 23 percent of American adults can name the three branches of government. But less so we, than 23 percent. Yeah. So you can say, oh, public ignorance. But it turns out we should teach that. It is being taught. It has been taught. 
if you look at state standards, it's required yeah, it to taught. teach yeah. at both middle school yeah. and high school. So we are teaching it. One well, of my metaphors well, what is... what are they for those watching at home? Legislative, judicial, and executive. There you go. Thank you. A for the course. Yeah. But a lot, of this, a lot of education is like throwing spaghetti against a wall and all comes down. How do you get the spaghetti to stick to the wall? If it's meaningless, I describe it as uh, memorize and forget tests. I was yeah, great yeah. at you know, memorizing the night before the test, getting my A, walking out, um, you know, I got an A in high school on the parts of a frog. Could I fill out a diagram on the parts of a frog today? No idea. Turns out in medical education, which is really high stakes, doctors forget about 50% of what they learned the previous year, and they only retain about 30% long time. So most of us forget most of what we learn in most educational circumstances. We're, we're literally, I, we're tagging a value to mm -hmm. every piece of knowledge mm -hmm. that we gain yep. based on our world view of retaining that knowledge. We're prioritizing the retention of that knowledge because we find it important or we find it unimportant to retain. And so when you kind of lead on your own terms, yep. you assign, in the sense, greater desire to learn the things that you're focused on. That way you're actually potentially retaining more of the knowledge that you're learning. I would add one other piece to that, which is social-emotional connections. Basically, um, Judith Rich Harris, one of my yeah. favorite authors, talks about how teens are much more influenced by peers than they are by adults, including parents, but also teachers. Mm. And so when, the way I'm looking at solving this problem is not yeah. trying to get them to care about something. I create a subculture where it's normal to talk about evolution, yeah. where yeah. it's normal to talk about history, where it's normal to try to understand modern problems in the and, you know, again, if it's normal for kids to argue, yes, yes. even if kid A, who really hates history, really hates biology, doesn't care at all, maybe comes from a religious household where they reject this, but all his or her friends are arguing about this, of course they'll do it. I mean, the fact is, you know, it turns out um, telling kids not to smoke, not very effective. If they hang out with kids that smoke, they'll probably smoke. If they hang out with kids that don't smoke, then they probably but won't smoke. But if they're debating the multivariability of smoking there we go. amongst each other, there we go. There we go. That's a good one. So, yeah. and that same thing can be applied to the potential um, addictions that we have to food and to social media, etc. That if the kids are talking about, oh well, you know, I feel this way when I eat too much or when I eat food that's not healthy or I feel this way when I'm obsessively on digital media versus then you can get them talking with each other about you know S S um, Sam feels that way and Paula feels this way etc. Totally and even you know to go to a great example from my perspective so many people regard Hungarian mathematics as in the 20th century as one of the greatest achievements uh, in all of mathematics. Paul Hungary Bush. produced yeah, yeah. exactly uh, there were a lot of amazing Hungarian mathematicians. It turns out that late 19th, early 20th century, Hungary had this kind of com competitive system where teens in high schools would compete for math prizes and then they also had a, a culture where they were talking and arguing about math problems. Yeah. So a Hungarian, the amazingness of 20th century Hungarian mathematics, I see as the direct result of a very distinctive subculture created by a relatively small number of schools where yeah. it became normalized to think, talk, and argue about math problems all the time. the time. Yeah. That's so interesting that you can identify the subcultural excellence to the root, which was their ability and desire to incentivize with prize systems, which is a really good way, I think, to incentivize learning and, and passion for entrepreneurship and so many other things, solving problems, mm -hmm. um, and also just the discourse. Okay, so we spent a good amount right. of time on that tension side of things, which is, which is really exciting to me. Um, and so now how many, how many total kids are with um, Austin San Francisco right now? We have about 50 kids, 50, cool. and probably next year we'll be at 70 or so. 70, so, you know, cool. we're small little communities, tiny yes. subcultures. I want to keep it at, um, Robin Dunbar, an evolutionary biologist, yeah, yeah. Dunbar's number, Dunbar's number yeah. you know, we evolved in communities, yeah, 150 or so, and so all communities are small. I think one of the problems with a large you know, public high school, 3,000 kids, um, they don't have that sense of connection. With you know, 100 kids or so, yeah. we can create a virtue subculture, and part of this is when you become larger, you need more rules. I know high school principals that spend all their time measuring girls' skirts. Yeah, yeah, is that yeah, skirt, yeah. you know, X inches? Exactly, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. But in a subculture, we don't have a lot of rules, we create norms. And if there's an issue, you know, does this count as being too rude or does that yeah, count yeah, as, yeah. let's talk about it. Very different from top-down rules. Yeah, and is, is this all 
K through 12? No, no, we're just a high school. So this is so all there's Higher Ground Education is our 12. parent company. High They're um, the yeah, leading teacher. organization modernizing and scaling Montessori. Okay. And so they've got about 30 Montessori schools across the US. And then we are the high school branch. So again, Maria Montessori didn't create a secondary school. Um, middle school is kind of in a transitional phase. Um, we are developing middle school programs. So ultimately okay. we'll have kids going all the way from pre-K Montessori um, through okay. ATI high schools. Okay, cool. So, so the the the, 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 the this four year old that you were illustrating that was like even when the teachers out of the room, they're still right. going and right. being accountable for their own learning yeah. and whatnot. Uh, so that would be part of the higher ground education, right? And that's part of the Montessori school system up until eighth grade, and then um, the Academy of Thought and Industry ATI is your high, high school, school model model of cool. Yeah. And yeah. so then they go all the way the pre K through twelve, right? Um, through that system, and then here's something an important question to address here. Um, <clears throat> so, thank you, Ron. Yep. So, one of the things that I think is, you know, let's let's we'll right. wrap on this quick, and then so we can get to the other stuff. Yep. But just it, it's it's tough sometimes for there there mm -hmm. are scholarships offered right. to those in low SES, right, right, um, because these are more on the this is pub, public school free right. of cost, but right, right, part of the taxpayers and right. the state, etc. Yeah, versus a Montessori system and a ATI system right. costs. Um, yeah. what is it about tens of thousands per year? Yeah, it's different like based that. on the city. It's you know more expensive in New York and San Francisco, cheaper in Austin and St. Louis, that kind of thing. But uh, kind of so I'm very interested in scaling this and making it cheaper. I see it as fundamental to get people to realize it's really about culture. That's the number one thing. So I have an article out yeah. there, how to give your child an expensive private education for $3,000 a year. And a lot of it is developing these norms in intera of interaction, which sounds strange because again, everybody thinks it's oh curriculum and so forth. But I think one of the problems with schooling as we know it is it gives people a wrong sense of what matters in education. And nobody is talking about developing the right habits and attitudes and creating subcultures. So you know, my wife and I have a school in Senegal and there, you know, first of all, I am a big fan of students teaching students and not only teaching but developing the subculture. So I'm most delighted when instead of adult teachers, basically most adult teachers have been trained to teach. If I create a Socratic subculture where it's normal for kids to be arguing about ideas, they can help each other. And so our school in Senegal, the basic model is older kids thinking, talking, arguing with younger kids. And that's a way to scale this up really cheaply. To give you one concrete example, um, 200 years ago, there was a system of education founded by Joseph Lancaster, a working class British kid, 18, and he created a system with teacher-student ratios of 1 to 100, 1 to 500, and sometimes 1 to 1,000, which sounds ridiculous, but it's all te students teaching students teaching students teaching students. And so in some ways, if we create subcultures where it's normal for kids to learn and teach, um, then we don't need teachers. And it sounds crazy, but this is, you know, you don't have to teach um, you know, teens the latest uh, slang words. They teach each other the slang words. <laughs> you know, how much are, how can we spend more money to get more people? No, that just happens. So this is the magic. If we can find a way, and this is kind of the frontier where I'm working, if we can find a way to normalize productive activity as natural peer interaction, yes. cheap and it's free. Basically it becomes free. Free, because then you have the kids in their free time obsessing about wanting to talk to each other about ideas. Exactly. And build those and create those. And, exactly. Yeah. And you know, in terms, I'm not saying, so you know, Mathemata in Greek is that which can be taught. And so I would say math and STEM is different and there's teaching, but kids can still teach each other. Um, we have students working on Khan Academy, a great resource, yeah. but the key there is to train the students to help each other with the math. Yeah. So yeah. then it becomes, so right now, most people were all excited about online learning. Online learning is gonna change the world. I would say online learning changes the world if and only if you create a subculture where teens or kids, even young kids, can take advantage of it. So what people excited about technology have not realized that we need the human technology to complement the other technology in order to create free education for the whole world. Um, so uh, my right, specialty yeah. in some ways is articulating and developing these human systems that then will, will allow for free education to be a reality around the world. You, you have that vision that I love so much. I agree that this is going to become more and more of a commonplace to see young people wanting to have the, the discourses about ideas and in, 
Making it commonplace will be so fun seeing four, six, eight, 10, 12 year olds working on talking about these ideas and building them out. This is, will be very fun. I'm glad you're at the cutting edge of this. I wanna ask you, cause you're at the cutting edge of a lot of other thinking as mm -hmm. well, especially in law and right. governance. Right. So this is, Kind of, this is kind of like we see little pockets of things happening. We see mm -hmm. the United States doing its thing. We see mm -hmm. China mm -hmm. doing its thing. Yeah. We see some other stuff happening in like Singapore. Yeah. So teach us about your thoughts around. So l let me give you a bit more context. Yes. So um, yeah, about almost 20 years ago now, uh, I met John Mackey, CEO of Whole Foods, founder, co-founder and CEO of Whole Foods. I had created a bunch of schools. He created a bunch of grocery stores. We agreed that we believed in entrepreneurial solutions to world problems and ultimately be the solution how entrepreneurs and conscious capitalists can solve all the world's problems was the outcome of that. But at the time, kind of looking at things, you know, social entrepreneurship was cool, micro entrepreneurship was cool, tech entrepreneurship was cool. But I started digging more deeply and I realized in a lot of ways the biggest problem is global poverty. Yeah. Um, and if yes. we can help people become prosperous. The first SDG. What, yeah. what a win. So, yeah. you know, if you know, and they started looking into it, it turns out that people are poor in most countries because of bad law and governance. And if we can create uh, or find a way f to allow them to access world-class law and governance, then they become prosperous. And just, you know, economic and growth- that tackles corruption and greed and gluttony at the same time. Well, maybe not governance. greed and gluttony. Um, <laughs> corruption, it turns out, is uh, a substantial portion of corruption is because poor countries are over-regulated. Almost nobody gets this. Um, actually, I'm working with, uh, the uh, Rosling, they have a factfulness site, and that's one of those things where almost nobody understands this. The, the anti-capitalists have said, oh, you know, the developing world has no regulations, and that's all why their people or companies are going there. Certainly in China, the special economic zones had almost no uh, regulation for a period of time, and more people escape poverty more quickly than ever before in history. So just important data point. Um, in China, 1980, even to 1990, average GDP per capita, um, including and roughly average wages, were about $1,000 per person. Now it's somewhere between six dollars to $10,000 per person, depending on which numbers you believe. Nobody trusts Chinese government numbers, but no doubt people have become massively prosperous. China is rapidly becoming a middle class society. Again, in Africa, it's still about $1,000 per person. And so you know, in China in the last 20, 30 years, um, almost a billion people have gone from poor to, by global standards, middle class. And they've done it because the special economic zones allowed for rapid economic prosperity. Meanwhile, most developing countries have terrible law and governance, massively overregulated, weak property rights. Um, mm -hmm. And as a consequence, you know, in Africa, uh, Magat and I talk about it's like swimming through molasses to get anything done. Yeah. You know, to get a building, building permit, to start a business, to you know, import goods. goods. It's just really hard. So this whole movement, when I, when I started Flow with John Mackey, that was what Flow was. Conscious capitalism was one of its descendants. We were looking at, okay, how do we, how do we accelerate prosperity? I met Mark Fraser, a brilliant guy who's, who had been involved in the economic, special economic zone industry. And he said, look, these zones are a way for fast growth. And he cited not only China where it's famous, but uh, zones developed into, or helped develop rapid growth in Mauritius, in Mexico, in Ireland, you know, many countries around the world. But then it's a matter of designing them. There's some horrible zones out there. So then you get into the nuance of how do you design zones. And it turns out one of the most important things and hardest to import is high quality law and governance. So okay. Dubai is an interesting innovator there. Where Dubai wanted to be a financial center, they have Sharia law and, you know, no interest. That's not cool for big finance. So they created a zone, 110 acres, for the Dubai International Financial Center, where within that 110 acres, it's British common law. Um, they actually had a, hired a prestigious London commercial law judge, and then Singapore, which is also British common law, commercial law judge. Now they wow. have a panel of you know, maybe 30 respected judges from around the world. And if you, um, you know, if you wanna be Citibank or Goldman Sachs and you're in the DIFC, um, your law is not Sharia law in Dubai. 
It's basically London law, world-class financial hub. It turns out all the best uh, financial centers run British common law. Hong Kong, Singapore, London, New York, Chicago, Sydney, all British common law countries. It's the best, think of it as technology again. Yeah. I'm very yeah. interested in, as it were, soft technology. So I love my iPhone. Sure. In education, I'm creating new cultures as a technology. This is, let's take the best of class legal system. If for finance, it's uh, London, then let's plunk it in Dubai. And in 20 years, Dubai has gone from basically no financial industry to being a top 10, just this year, top 10 global financial hub. Pretty incredible. So so in incredible. In 20 years. In, now in 10 years to become in a top 10. 10 years to yeah. become top 10, which is yeah unheard of. And so you can take the code, yeah. this technology yeah. of, of, of British common law and plunk it into an area uh, and then see what happens when people from around the world want to come and partake in this. And it's also interesting hearing about 30 judges yeah. from around the world from these hubs partaking in yeah. that because that's what you'd want. Right. You'd want uh, a very strong uh, international way of, because these are internationally uh, acting, organizing businesses and entities that yeah. are taking an international. No, affairs. no, big time. So just a couple of footnotes. Yeah. Um, so this is so successful that Abu Dhabi is kind of copied at wholesale just a couple of years ago. And Honduras has uh, legislation to allow for this, and they were looking at importing Dubai, the Dubai version of British common law, into Honduras. You know, and so the yeah. way I see this growing is the old special economic zones, yeah, brought you know billion more than a billion people out of poverty, um, but those didn't address this legal system issue. The Dubai innovation is to create a new legal system and plop it down. And you know, I'm talking to various countries in Africa. In the Sharia law zone, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah, so you imagine that, all yeah. these African countries say with you know terrible corruption and bad law, if we can successfully kind of plug in high quality law. And one yeah. of the, as you say, one of the important things about the justices is we trust not only the law but also the judges to yeah. produce good law. Yeah. And so if we can do this successfully, I see global poverty being reduced very rapidly. And it even gets into the immigration you know, issue. Right now, you know, both in Europe and in the US, there are all of these uh, really pretty anti-immigrant parties, racist, frankly, parties coming into being because of all the opposition to immigration. Whatever one thinks about that, if we can create great places with great jobs for them to live at home, you know, the Hondurans will stay home, the Africans will stay at home, and they'll be prosperous, and at some point, you know, we'll have this global cosmopolitan world, world where yes. right now, you know, a lot of people want to move to Singapore or Hong Kong. Um, Dubai's trick here for a lot of reasons, yes, but, yes. you know, we, we ha now have this kind of global um, approach to we want world-class law and governance everywhere yes. so that we can create entrepreneurial value yes. wherever we are. And we eradicate that's poverty through that. And yes. then peace too. Because, and peace and um, trust that exactly. you can move wherever you want around the world. Yes. And there'll still be big chunks of bad governance, but the more we can kind of create these islands, in some yes. ways it's a vision of the world becoming city-states and the nation-state becomes obsolete. Yeah. Yeah, fastest yeah. growing entities in the last 50 years, Hong Kong and Singapore, you know, Shenzhen, yes. the special economic zone across from Hong Kong, just surpassed Hong Kong in GDP per capita. Not GDP, total GDP. Total yeah. So, you know, part of this vision is lots of little city states or zones, whatever, and ultimately uh, we eliminate poverty. And then, you know, on the education side, then we create happiness and well being instead of, because I'll acknowledge a lot of the first phase thing is pure greed. So there will be, there's a kind of an ugliness um, yeah. about that phase of development. And that's because there's no real judges in law that is uh, holding the uh, authoritarian dictators uh, uh, from from killing dissidents and, and stripping away resources for just themselves. All these different types of things. So when you have when you have an earth that has these eight billion people, and then you have these islands of the city states that slowly flourish, and people say that's the long governance we want, the world class long governance, yeah. then the whole earth becomes that. That will be a very exciting. See, I like your, your vision. So let me use, yeah, add yeah. another piece. So e-government, and this is where it becomes closer to technology, a hard technology. So you know, Estonia is one of the world's leaders in e-government. Yeah. One of the things that you know we're actually looking at piloting in Africa is um, suppose we had government where it was completely transparent. Every yeah. receipt going into government, yes. every payment going out yes. was something that you or I could audit. So if you were not sure what 
um, you know, the mayor of the town was doing or what, whatever politician is doing, you just go online and audit it. Or, you know, business registration. You know, in the U.S. you can get online and create an LLC in no time at all. In Africa it takes, you know, months of, you know, meetings and business and payments and bribes and all of that. It's a mess. So imagine um, if everything was as easy to do as your favorite online business and all law and governance services were, you know, you check your app, okay, started a business, okay, uh, building permit, they come in, maybe the drone flies over, checks this mm -hmm. out, and sometimes you need humans. But imagine uh, governance as a technology, and we have the current state of our e-governments are, you know, basically the internet in 1991, and we see this glow, so all the, all the cool innovators create these um, cool apps where ultimately old style governments fades into the past and we have fully transparent, auditable, functional government around the world yeah. and it, they're competing so that, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and some of this yeah. is you may like Singapore government, uh, whereas I think, you know, uh, it's too hard ass. Um, I may yeah. like San Francisco, yeah, sure, sure. you know, f freedoms and, you know, maybe you're from Dubai and, you know, yeah, yeah. Less. Whatever. So, uh, la plus la change. You know, we want everybody to do what they do as long as they're not violent. I'm a radical pluralist. Yeah, and we'll right. have, you know, as long as they're not violent, we'll have fundamentalist Christian communities, Mormon communities, uh, radical, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, all sorts of different people. As long yeah, as they're not violent. as long as yeah. they're not violent. Yeah. Well, we got to have the big violence before we get there, though. No? <laughs> well, um, we'll, we'll let you have Fight Club. You, you can have your own little Fight Club somewhere. Oh, I'm a lover, not a fight. There we go. Good, good. There we go. There okay, we go. Um, this has been so fascinating. I'm just I'm so in love with, with your passions and your mind and you. I love what you're building. Thanks. So, you. so important. Academy of Thought Industry. Guys, check it out below. Um, oh, just quick, quickly mm -hmm. on the way out. This yeah. is simulation, so we must ask you, are we in a simulation? Uh, for me, it's all very real. There's nothing simulated. I love reality. And it's a base reality then? It's a beautiful reality. Or here, we are creating reality. This is where I'm a big believer in creativity. Yeah. So the world I just described, we can create. And by means of talking about it, we're going to help create it. Yes. Or we can let all those people with a lot of uh, hostile, negative. Sure, sure. So one more thing, because you're into creation. Uh, and earlier you talked about new concepts, neologisms and so forth. Yes. I'm very interested in the notion that as we develop new concepts, if they map onto reality, we can create new things. Correct. So uh, the notion of innovations in law governance, the notions of innovation yes. in the culture. And more young people talking about these things in discourse. Exactly. You know, as, as an entrepreneur, I see four stages. There's um, fantasy, there's vision, there's game plan and then there's execution action, yeah, execution, execution. Cool. and a lot of you know people you know drink in bars and do the fantasy Ideas, thing yeah. but i'm very interested in the transition from fantasy to vision, vision and then yeah. vision to plan and yeah. boom let's do it that's such a good one i love it okay okay and last question is what is the most beautiful thing in the world well, obviously my wife <laughs> um, and the true the good and the beautiful yeah i'm a platonist at heart yeah We can do this. We can do this. And have fun doing it. The and other piece is having fun. It. Yeah. Again, that's the thing is all these people coming from anger and hatred and negativity, I feel sorry for them. You know, I have so yeah. much fun going in and talking with kids about things, yes. ideas and, and seeing their joy. Uh, you know, I want parents to have fun talking to their yes. kids. You know, all of this is easy if we transition. You know, Vipassana sounds weirdo to go to 10 days and say nothing. Fun is a different word, but I long for that. Play. It done right, Play. what is good for us yes. is joyful and enjoyable. So I'm us. not happy when, you know, I'm eating things that are bad for me and Correct. you know bad habits. Bad Correct. habits are ultimately not fun. Correct, yeah. But part of this is culture. I would say, my friends go out for beer, I go out for beer. If my friends do yoga, I go out for yoga. So I even, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I think right. the social thing. So we sure. blame teens. You teens ought to be better. No, no, let's put them in a culture where it's normal. So let's create cultures yeah. where it's normal to be good and nice and entrepreneurially creative and all that. Then it happens. It's tricky how to create the cultures. But if we can Correct. do this, big win. We're going to have a fun and playful time building the future. I there we go. It. I love it. Michael, this has been such a pleasure. Such Wonderful a hour. Wonderful yes. hour.
Oh my gosh. Okay, keep building, keep going. Everyone, please go and check out the links below to Academy of Thought and Industry. Also check out the Conscious Capitalism link. Also check out Michael's books as well. The link to his books are down there. The link to his LinkedIn's down there. Um, thank you, Ron Vargas, for producing and directing. We love you very much. Give us your thoughts on the com- in the comments and in our public telegram, the links below. Let's get talking about these things. Let's get talking about how to get the youth having these Socratic dialogues with each other about wanting to talk about ideas and bring them into to the world. Also, support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Go and support them. Our links are below if you believe in us. Help us expand and grow and prosper. Help out your communities. Bring that forth. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you so much. Thank you. And we will see you soon. Peace. Wonderful. That's it. Good job. That was great.